your own opinion of this phrase. Okay, so. Which is hard to understand. Good. So when I first started thinking about um, complexity, well, first of all, I was a complete amateur. Um, but there was nothing, and I emphasize the word nothing, known about the way complexity evolves with time. At least there was nothing known to me, and I think basically very nothing known. Now today I would say there is nothing known about the way complexity evolves. <laughs> There's a difference. I wouldn't emphasize the nothing so much as I would emphasize the known. Meaning to say, nobody knows how to prove anything. But there are ideas. And uh, let me just backtrack a little bit and uh, tell you where the ideas came from. A lot of it came from a paper by Hayden and Preskill, which uh, actually originated a little bit earlier from uh, some work that I did, which had to do with how fast systems thermalize by dropping a particle onto a horizontal black hole, you can see that, it, uh, that the system equilibrated information spread over the horizon anomalously quickly in a logarithmic time in the entropy. I didn't know what to make out of that. It just seemed, why is it happening so fast? Oh, well, it's just happening so fast. <laughs> I didn't know what to make out of it. But that observation was used as an inspiration by Patrick and uh, John Preskill. And the, um, apart from the way they used it to discuss cloning, it was an inspiration for a way of thinking about the evolution of certain kinds of systems, uh, the kind of systems that might well describe black holes. We can say that the, uh, the kind of systems are the fast scramblers. And the fast scramblers are systems which are k-local, which means everybody is coupled to everybody else. The kind of systems that that's why K studies. Uh, but the description that Patrick and John used was of a quantum circuit, and in fact a random quantum circuit. Now, why random quantum circuits work as well as they do to describe black holes or to describe Hamiltonian systems? I don't really know. Well, I think a lot of it is probably buried in. Uh, and the greater thoughts of Frank about random matrices and, uh, and uh, the seminar he gave last week. But uh, I think we'll just accept it for now that a good description of how k local systems evolve is given by a class of random circuits which work as follows. You, you know this, but I just wanted to lay it out on the table. Circuits, quantum circuits, which have a property that, first of all, is a clock. And the clock divides time into intervals. Those intervals are such that in each interval, every qubit gets to act once. So that is to say, every qubit is involved in one gate. For simplicity, I could just take a problem where, uh, where the dynamics is through two qubit gates. And so every qubit gets to act once. This one may act with this one. This one with this one. Did I miss any? This guy with this one. This one with this one. This one with this one. I think I made an odd number by accident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with having an odd number, except you have to make up a new rule. <laughs> okay, so here. And then in the next uh, time interval, you redistribute the way that the gates act randomly and do the same thing over and over and over again. We can call these time intervals here L. And I choose my <coughs> notation for later purposes to indicate LADS, but uh, we'll come to that. We'll just call it L. Uh, 
And the first thing about such circuits, I'm simply using this for inspiration now, inspiration to say something which is not completely obvious. Um, the first fact about such circuits is that the number of gates, first of all, grows linearly with the time. And it grows with n over 2 gates, or k over, I think I call the various places, I, I call it the number of qubits k rather than n. I'll continue to call it that. k over 2 qubits are involved uh, in every time step. The number of qubits that act grows linearly with time. But the other fact is that the number of, uh, the number of gates that acts is extensive in the number of qubits. For a given time interval, the number of gates that acts is proportional to the number of qubits, equal to the number of qubits. So in that sense, the number of gates that act is extensive. The other piece of, um, the other piece of uh, inspiration is the idea that if you have a particular circuit or a particular dynamics, that for some length of time, the unitary operator that it generates, that the least complex way of generating that unitary operator is the circuit that you used to construct it. Now, um, again, I don't know if that's a theorem or not. It is a theorem in the complexity geometry way that Nielsen described. It was one of the first questions I asked complexity people Vazirani and uh, Berkeley, Patrick, other people, and they scratched their head and they said, oh, that sounds plausible. Plausible was good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so the growth of complexity, at least early on, at least early on, the growth of complexity, let's call it C dot, the time rate of complexity growth, is, first of all, extensive proportional to the number of qubits. Let's take that, yeah. So, so why do we stipulate that at every time step a qubit can only interact with one other guy? So why could, I mean, if we just look at the Hamiltonian, it in will... Retrospect, be, in retrospect, in retrospect, okay, we'll go ahead. Well, I was going to say, in the Hamiltonian, yeah. you know, this one qubit will have, can interact even if it's, say, two local with all other and minus one oh, qubits, this even is, at an instant yeah, time. This is the quantum circuit, discrete quantum circuit this, uh, analog of something if we were really doing Hamiltonians, we would say the Hamiltonian was a sum of k qubit terms. All right, but each term in the sum, uh, ah, okay, okay. yeah, okay. I think the word is trotterization. Um, but uh, this, is the, this is the discrete analog of the Hamiltonian circuit. All right, but um, for whatever reason, this works. In what sense does it work? It gives you the fast scrambling description that was consistent with how information spreads over the horizon of a black hole. That was the, that was the logic of it. And it still is today. And as I said, there's, uh, there's not much which is known with a capital K. Okay, so um, the time rate of change of complexity, we should make some guesses. Uh, the complexity, at least for a finite amount of time, uh, the complexity simply grows the same way as the number of gates in the circuit grows. And that's proportional to the number of qubits, which in some more general context, we would take to be the entropy. The entropy of a, of, a, of a random state of a system of qubits would just be the number of qubits. So k could be replaced by the entropy. But now we need a notion of the time step. What is the appropriate time step? And, or in other words, we need another quantity to multiply this, which, which, which is a rate. So again, the only rate, only natural rate for a system of interacting uh, qubits is one possible definition of the rate would be the energy per qubit. Okay? 
The reason that that may not be so good is because you may have energy in the system which is not computing. For example, the ground state of an extreme black hole. Our charged black hole, its ground state has energy, and that energy is not computing. Okay. Typically, the temperature is the thing which governs the rate at which uh, interactions take place. The higher the temperature, the faster. And um, yeah, uh, is the temperature, which in many cases is pretty much the same as the energy per cubic. But in the cases which are a little bit ambiguous, for example, the case of the extremal black hole, uh, it's not quite the same. And so the natural rate here would be S times T. This I'm going to assume, and this, is a, this appears to be a fairly general uh, guess, but it's only reasonable for times less than the time that it takes for the system to reach maximal complexity. So we would not expect this to go on forever. Uh, but during this time that the complexity is increasing linearly, and which is simply following the circuit that built the state, this is a, it's a guess. Lenny, yeah. it, you just said that in an extremal black hole you might conclude that degrees would not all the degrees of computing. Yeah. Does that mean that that S there should not be the full S? No. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. What happens is it stops computing not because of S, but it slows its, the T that goes to zero. That's fine. And it's, right, it's always the full S times T. Now, how that fits with your calculation, I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> um, and this is true for charged black holes, it's true for neutral black holes, it's true for rotating black holes, at least rotating two-dimensional BTZ black holes. So, um, yeah. So how is this different from the energy? S times T is like the, like the thermodynamic energy, right? Right, but it doesn't contain the ground. It doesn't, yeah. Right. right. If we have a chunk of ice in the room, the chunk of ice has simply an energy proportional to its baryon number that's not computing. Ice, I mean zero temperature ice. Right. So we have to throw that part away. And what we mean is what could be called internal energy or heat energy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and it doesn't matter very much whether you use S times T or um, integral of uh, uh, SDT. Okay. They generally are very proportional to each other. Okay. So as and. You know, this is admittedly, admittedly a guess, and it's still a guess. It's still a guess. It needs proof, but I have no idea how to prove it. I have the vaguest idea how to prove it. Uh, good. This is the basic complexity side of things that I will use today. On the other side, we have geometry, space-time geometry in particular. And the things we're going to use from space-time geometry are just black hole metrics. And for simplicity today, I will assume this is there I'll assume <laughs> BTC. <easy. laughs> I always forget which side do you use? <laughs> we'll come back to this uh, figure in a little while, but um, okay. On the geometry side, just the metric of a black hole. That's what we're going to explore. And for simplicity, only for simplicity today, we're going to do B plus Z black holes or two plus one dimensions. They're easy. But um, all the general things I'm going to talk about are true in higher dimensions. The S squared is equal to my, you know the formula? And for BTZ, this would be R squared, B theta squared. Okay, this is called the emblackening factor. That's a thing I did not know until Brian Swindle told me that that's called the emblackening factor. 
I don't know where that terminology came from. Do you ever hear it in the old days? No. Okay, and for BTZ, f of r is equal to 1 over L squared. Now, it's not obvious at this point that the L that I'm using here is the same as the L that I used on the previous transparency, which has now become transparent. <laughs> uh, primes. Anybody got a guess? Anybody remember? I do. <laughs> R squared minus mu squared. Mu squared, of course, mu is the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. It's the place, it's the R at which the blackening factor goes to zero. Uh, and that's it, that's, uh, that's uh, BTZ. Okay. One other fact, all right, let's write out the facts. Mu is equal to the Schwarzschild radius. I will, never, I will never use it, I won't use the term Schwarzschild radius anymore. Mu is the Schwarzschild radius. And the other fact is, this, this actually won't come up. But nevertheless, mu squared, in terms of the is 8 g l squared, same l squared, times the mass of the BPZ black hole. So if you want to know the connection with the mass, that's it. Okay. Now I think the last time we talked about this notion of maximal slices, the proposed connection proposed connection between um, complexity and geometry is that if we foliate the geometry with maximal slices, and maximal slices means maximal volume slices, they look something like this. As time goes up, the surface over here goes up that the volume of the portion of the maximal slice inside the horizon is identified with the complexity of the quantum state. Now, um, it doesn't matter. You can worry about what happens on the outside here. Well, I'll, I'll tell you later, but for the time being, let's just take the definition of the complexity of the black hole, meaning the degrees of freedom of the system, the horizon degrees of freedom of the system, is the portion of this curve inside the horizon. Uh, the portion outside is really mostly identified with some complexity of formation of the thermal field double state. So let's concentrate on this here. And as you go up to t equals infinity, as the anchoring points go up to t equals infinity, the, uh, the maximal surface does not go up to the singularity, but it goes up to some asymptotic late time version of one of these minimal slices that in fact it is a surface of constant Schwarzschild R. I call it R final. Why final? Because it's sort of the last maximal, maximal slice. There are no maximal slices above it. It corresponds to t equals infinity from the anchoring point of view. And uh, that's the, uh, that's, if you like, the final slice. What I want to do is first, what we're going to do now is we're going to work out the geometry of the volume or the, the, the character of the, geome the geometry of these maximal slices, work out their volume, and compare it with what we know about complexity or what we you know. Meaning, sort of. Okay. So, yeah. Once the time gets late enough, or let, let me draw a picture. To, let's draw a picture, a late time picture, a very late time picture. Take this big here. At late times, we have this asymptotic surface here. Now let's back off a little bit, not go to infinite time, but go to late time. What does a maximal slice look like? Well, it basically just goes in and hugs the maximal, the maximal slice here very closely until it departs and goes back out to the boundary here. The distance over which it um, 
hugs, hugs the, uh, the maximal slice in here is basically the time at which the place was anchored. This distance over here is also t. Okay, so one of the things you see, and the important things you see, is as time goes on, the maximal slice grows, but it grows out from the edges here. It grows out from the edges at very late times, or even moderately late times. The curve is basically this asymptotic slice, and then you just add onto it and onto it and onto it. But let's suppose we want the volume of this portion of it now. The volume of it, just from the metric here, from the metric, we first of all have a square root of the volume of it. What does volume mean? The volume means the space-like volume. Now, which are the space-like coordinates? Outside the black hole, R and theta are space-like coordinates. Inside the black hole, T and theta are the space-like coordinates. Right. So the space-like metric contains f of R and it contains R squared. And the square root of the determinant of the metric uh, sorry, the square, yeah, the square root of the determinant of the metric is the square root of the spatial metric is f of r, that's from here, and then from here, r squared. That's, this, that's the square root of the determinant of the metric. And the integral of this is first of all a theta integration, which gives us a 2 pi volume of the spatial slice, and um, dt, which just becomes, when we do the integral, it's just t. The integral dt is just t. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, let me give this a name here. The thing under the square root here, I'll call g. So g is equal to f of r times r squared. And the volume then just becomes square root of g here. That's the volume on such a slice. And neglected to say one thing. This asymptotic slice is at a fixed value of r. That's easy to see. It's at a fixed value of r. And so one way of finding the maximal slice is just finding the maximum value of g of r as a function of r behind the horizon. Okay, so g of r had two factors in it. It had f of r and r. f of r goes to zero at the horizon. The horizon is down here somewhere. The, the bifurcate horizon is down here somewhere. It goes to zero over here because of this factor and it goes to zero at the singularity because of the other factor. So there's going to be a maximum somewhere in between. And that maximum somewhere in between determines the structure of the maximal slices. So let's, uh, let's work it out. Let's calculate the r. It's called r final. Let's calculate it. We just have to differentiate g. So we have to first calculate g. But g just comes from here. So g. Let's, we don't need to, uh, yeah, let's, let's put it in. 1 over L squared, R squared minus mu squared, and then R squared. There's the other factor here. Okay, this is very simple. One of the nice things about the BTZ black hole is uh, the blackening factor is so simple that you can work out everything uh, without, uh, without very much thought. This R squared minus mu squared as a function, as a function of r squared, let's see, it's, it should be mu squared minus r squared. Why? Because we're behind the horizon of the black hole. So it's mu squared minus r squared. But whatever it is, it's a function which looks like that, and it's maximized halfway as a function of r squared. As a function of r squared, the factor is r squared minus mu squared times r squared. Looks like this. And where is it maximized? It's maximized that r squared is equal to a half of mu squared. Okay. So r final squared is equal to one half 
u squared, which is in fact one half of the uh, horizon value of r, of r squared. I put it this way, r, one over the square root of two mu. Okay. So that says that the um, that the radius at the final surface is proportional to the radius at the horizon with a factor of one over the square root of two. That one over the square root of two varies from dimension to dimension, but never varies very much. It's uh, rather remarkably stable. Okay, so we've found out where the maximal slice is. Let me just draw one more picture. Again, looking at this maximal slice. So here, the asymptotic one. Each point on here is a circle. There's a circle in theta. Everything is homogeneous. Time translation invariant, which in this case means translation invariant along the space-like surface here, until, until it pops out of the uh, horizon. All right, so what it looks like is it looks like a cylinder, or at least a portion inside the horizon, <coughs> looks like a cylinder, a cylinder of length t. And what does it look like as time goes on? Well, you add <coughs> Here's that magnets that you stack up like this, just round little disc-like magnets. And if I had them, I would have brought them here. But you start with a bunch of them, and you add one by one by one to the edges. And that's the way this maximal slice grows. And at any given time, its length is t. All right, I want to figure out how the volume of it grows. How the volume of it grows with time. Why? Because I want to compare it with the way that complexity grows with time. So what we need to do is calculate how the volume of this grows with time. I mean, The volume dt is equal to 2 pi, the 2 pi I'll retain, but it doesn't, it's not going to do very much, times square root of g final or g at r final. That was the formula. r final is equal to mu over square root of 2. And so if we plug that in, we find the dt is equal to 2 pi over L mu squared over 2, it's rid of the 2 there, and the rate of change of the volume here is just 1 over L times, now um, volume means two-dimensional volume here. Volume means two-dimensional volume. The rate of change of two-dimensional volume has units of a length, has units of a length, mu has units of a length, so this is length squared divided by length, the right units, and that's the uh, time rate of change of the volume. Okay. Now I want to relate that to other quantities, and the other quantities, I guess we, I'll probably regret erasing this, but let's do it anyway. Okay, so that's the VDT. Let me define two other quantities. Well, first of all, it's just the area of the horizon. Now, area in this case means one dimensional area. Right? And that is ah, 2 pi mu. This is of the horizon. 2 pi mu, that's one statement. And the other thing has to do with the surface gravity. The surface gravity is by definition f prime, the derivative of f with respect to r, at the horizon, at rh, divided by 2. This is definition. I can't help but I don't know why the two is there. Somebody probably got to do with something Newton probably invented at some point. What's the reason for the two? Is it to make the temperature maybe? Well, no. It, no, this is equal to two pi. Oh, yeah. 
times the temperature. Yes. Well, yes. No, it's because the, the surface gravity having the factor of two makes what? it. The, Which is it? The, if the surface gravity has a factor of two, it makes it the exact relation between the affine and the Ooh, affine, affine and non affine parameter of like the horizon generators in ordinary I, 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 GR. I suspect it has, yeah, you're probably right, but I suspect <laughs> it has something to do with Newton and. Uh, and uh, does it have to do with uh, one half mv squared somehow? It goes. It has to do with if, sure. you, if you hang thing, something by a tether. Yeah. Uh, it is the acceleration you have to supply right. infinity. Right. If you miss the factor of two, it would be twice that acceleration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just curious. <laughs> And this, of course, is equal to the entropy of the black hole. It's the area over 4G is equal to entropy. So this is 4G times the entropy. Right? Okay. On the other hand, what we have area of the horizon is just this. Let's calculate this. Let's calculate the surface gravity using that f is equal to 1 over l squared times r squared minus mu squared. It's easy to do. You take out your, um, your uh, pocket calculator or your uh, computer or whatever, and you differentiate r squared. And you plug in what? You plug in r horizon. So what you find is that the surface gravity is here is equal to mu over L squared. Did I get that right? Yeah. Mu over L squared. The two that you get from differentiating cancels the two here. Maybe that's why it's there. <coughs> OK. And as I said, we also have that the area of the horizon is equal to 2 pi times mu. Multiply these two together, and multiply by L. Well, what happens to uh, dv dt is over here. So here's dv dt, mu squared over L. Here we have mu over L squared. If I multiply k by a, I get mu squared over L squared, so I have to multiply by L, uh, let's see, to get dv dt. In any case, after a simple calculation, one finds that dv by dt, I'll keep the 2 pi, but by now it's uh, Oh, it, it's there. L times G. The G comes from, uh, from here. No? G, what else? S times T. Okay, you multiply K, which is related to the temperature, by A, which is related to the entropy, and you get the time rate of change of the volume. And if you work it out, here it is. This is the time rate of change of the volume. OK, this is good because we see that it's proportional to s times t, which was the conjectured rate of change of complexity. So if we now write that down, it says this is equal to complexity by dt, and we have now a relationship between the volume of the maximal slice and, uh, and the complexity. Complexity is equal to the volume of the maximal slice divided by, and by now I think I'll just drop the 2 pi because uh, the, uh, the overall normalization of the complexity is somewhat ambiguous. Let's just drop the numerical constant for now. And times g times l. That's the connection, or the proposed connection, 
between complexity and the volume of the maximal slice. What went into it? Some geometry on the geometry side, and on the other side was um, the idea that the time rate of change of complexity is entropy times energy. Sorry, entropy times temperature. Okay, uh, let me just say a quick word now. Not intended to be um, intended to be very naive at this point about the connection between complexity and action. Now this is this is naive, and if we have time. We we'll want to do this in more um, correct. Uh, but uh, just to give you a picture, let's go back to the Penrose diagram. You probably know that the real Penrose diagram for BTZ has a bit of a curve here. The curve isn't going to play any role, and since I find it harder to draw curves in straight lines, I'll just draw straight lines. Okay. Now, let's anchor our points over here. The, what we're thinking about is a connection between a property of a quantum state, the quantum state being defined by the property of the boundary quantum state, in this case complexity, and the geometry is of the interior geometry here. Um, it has long been thought, I don't know how long, that the dual of a quantum state, the ADS-CFT dual of a quantum state, uh, is you can force yourself to try to think of it as a bulk state on a time slice, but which time slice? Well, the maximal time slice is a possible time slice to find an gauge invariant way, but that's okay. But uh, there's another way to think about it, again, which you probably know, which is to think of the family of all space-like time slices from here to here, and that's the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. It's something that uh, somebody called the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. I don't remember what it was again. It's everything, the union of all space-like slices uh, connecting this side to this side. Oh, before I do this, let's come back to this formula here. Let's come back to this formula. Where is the formula? Let's come back to the formula. The formula was complexity is equal to volume over G times L A B S. Uh, yeah. I want to point out one thing, that for all ADS black holes, the proper time between the horizon over here and the singularity is always the same. It's independent of the mass of the black hole. In other words, the ADS black holes, you don't get any benefit if you're going to jump into a black hole, the benefit, I mean time, before you hit the singularity by jumping into a big one instead of a small one. Uh, the time that you have from the time that you jump in is always LADS in all dimensions and in all, uh, uh, all masses of the black hole. So this distance here is LADS. Let's take this formula and multiply it and divide it by LADS. This here was a spatial volume, so let's call that, in our case here, this is the volume of a two-dimensional slice. If I multiply it by L on the top and bottom, this becomes the, the space-time volume. The space-time volume, let's say, between here and here. The space-time volume of a solid cylinder. The solid cylinder is a little bit weird. It has the property that its radial direction is time-like. Okay. But aside from that, uh, it's a solid cylinder. If you start it over here, that's the place. That's the place where the radius is biggest. That's out here. So the boundary here would be, the boundary of the cylinder would be the horizon itself, right over here. And somewhere in here, 
would be a circle which would be the maximal slice. Okay, but the important point is that the radius of the cylinder is LADS, and therefore the two-dimensional volume times L would become the three-dimensional volume, or the space-time volume. Let's call that volume. Let's just call it space-time volume. Oh, S and T. No, we don't want to call it that. Uh, V3. Uh, that's the space-time volume divided by G and LADS squared. LADS squared is related to the cosmological constant, to the vacuum energy, which is negative, of course, uh, for ADS. But apart from the sign, this is just the cosmological constant. Let's put an absolute value there. And space-time volume times cosmological constant has units of, uh, of action. One, of course, has to be more careful in knowing exactly what the action is. It has boundary terms and so forth. We'll come back to those. But in a simplistic uh, view of it, this is where the idea that action is connected to complexity. Just by taking the previous formula, multiplying it and dividing it by L, and uh, seeing that what's in the numerator here has the look of an action in the presence of a cosmological constant. Okay, any questions up to here? Good, so then action, complexity is action, or at least has units of action divided by Newton constant. Then I'm not going to, well, I'll carry that, I'll just point out one other thing to you about this connection with action, which is kind of interesting. Um, the question is, does it also apply in any reasonable sense? I'm going to tell you a fact now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to derive it. Does it apply to black holes not in ADS? So um, I will tell you what happens <coughs> if you uh, start calculating. Again, does what hold? Hmm? What, do, what does what hold for black holes? That I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the action. Oh, yeah, connection with action. All right. Right. All right. So complexity is S times T times T. That, that's what I will assume. Okay. Good. S times T. What's that? So the question is whether S times T is equal to comp to the action of flat space black holes. But I, I was just saying, like the connection to the action. You're, no. uh, sorry. So the connection between the action and complexity, the complexity of what? In a case where we don't have just have <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. So right. That, that was the right. So, uh, good question. But my definition for the moment, my definition is complexity. Yeah. Okay. okay. We assume we have some quantum circuit beside, and, and and you're right. The, the, no, 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 sure. uh, so, this is what I mean for the moment. That's a complexity. Now, what we found is in ADS, this was the volume, in this case, a space-like volume. Let's call it D minus, uh, D minus 1, space-like volume, divided by L times G. But now we're not in the anti-decidus space anymore. We don't have an LADS. It turns out if you do the same calculation, namely you take S times T times T and convert it to geometric quantities. Again, the same, same procedure. What you find is that this LADS is replaced by R Schwarzschild. Otherwise, it's the same. It's replaced by R Schwarzschild. But now what happens when you try to think about action? The action what is the action? The action is integral r uh, squared of g and so forth. So questions? Yeah. So you are still considering the volume of the of the slice, maximal volume slice inside the horizon. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, it doesn't go to the boundary. Or well, we take. Uh, that's right. The, yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Um, yes. So the question is, how do you anchor it? Yeah. But I think you can. An I, I think you can. You can anchor it in a couple of different ways. But you can anchor it 
You can anchor it out here by looking at uh, time slices at different times. Another way to anchor it, which is kind of interesting, which I like, is to draw a vertical line here. Now, what this vertical line roughly means is, it is that it's a place where you go over from being in what people call the zone of the black hole to the outside region. It's the top of the uh, centrifugal yeah. barrier. The, it's not the interior of the black hole from the horizon point of view, but it's, uh, it's uh, I guess you'd call this the photon sphere. Then you can anchor it here. That's one way you can do it. Okay. Um, but I think you can anchor it infin at an infinity also, uh, uh, in using standard Schwarzschild time. OK, so R is 0. Curvature is zero. There is no action in that sense. Uh, so it, uh, you can't have complexity is equal to um, uh, uh, this integral. This integral is just zero. But this is a true fact that when you account for the surface boundary terms, when you correctly account for the boundary terms in the action, in what are they call uh, York. Uh, you want Hawking? York, given the uh, uh, terms, it uh, it works out anyway that this is equal to the action uh, again divided by g. So it's all in the it's all in the boundary terms for the uh, for the um, Schwarzschild black hole. Schwarzschild black hole in empty space. So there again, the Wheeler DeWitt patch that. Starting oh. from the points where you draw, you anchor yeah, this on the surface. Right. Um, OK. I, I think when I actually did this, I anchored things on here. OK. Right. All right, so that, uh, that's a fact. Make of it what you will. Um, All right, now let's come to another subject. Not another subject, but another, uh, another part of this subject. The confirmation of the connection between complexity and, uh, and geometry. We want to vary the geometry. We want to, uh, we want to vary the geometry, calculate volumes or actions. Not much difference, it turns out. Let's, uh, let's stick for the time being with volumes. We want to vary the geometry by perturbing it and recalculate the volume and find an argument, a circuit kind of argument analogous to the argument uh, that we used before, some kind of circuit argument to compute uh, the complexity. And again, we want to compare volume and complexity and we want to try to vary the geometry in a wide variety of ways. Okay. So you probably know what we're going to do is vary the geometry by perturbing the boundary, make shock waves on the one hand, calculate the response to the shock waves of the volume that we'll do next time. But for this time, what I want to do is the circuit analysis of the same thing. Uh, to put it in context, before we calculate the circuit, let me just uh, put it in context. What we're going to do is something like this. We're going to start with the thermal field double state at t equals zero. Thinking of it as a maximally um, as a maximally entangled state. Roughly speaking, we can think of it as a product of uh, two qubit systems maximally entangled simple as possible such thing. We're going to send in a shock wave from here. Oh, and this has some complexity. This has some complexity. Whether we can calculate it or not is not important because we won't actually need it. But it has some complexity. But the portion of the complexity behind the horizon is clearly zero here. Now we're going to send in a shock wave. And we're going to recalculate it. But to send in a shock wave, the way to send in a shock wave uh, using um, uh, quantum mechanics is to take the thermal field double state, go backward in time a certain amount, take the thermal field double, 
go backward in time with a time development going backward, apply an operator, let's call it W, that's what the Schenker and Stanford call it, and then apply U dagger to get back here. And we now have a state at time t equals zero, which is the same thing that we would have had had we put in a perturbation W at this point down here. The perturbation W creates a shock wave, and now we're going to want to recalculate the, um, the volume, let's say, over here, and compare it with the additional, comp or whatever we think the complexity we should have due to this event over here. The extra complexity is just the complexity added to the thermal field double state by applying this operator. So what we're interested in then is the complexity of, oh, I'll assume that W is unitary. Let's assume W is unitary. It could be a single qubit operator if the system is made out of qubits. All the qubit operators are, um, are unitary. So U dagger W U is a unitary operator. It has a complexity. And the question is, what is the complexity? It's called complexity of, and I guess we can call this W of T. What is the complexity of that? In other words, what's the minimum number of gates that it takes to make this operator? That's the question. Number one. And number two, can we compare it with the volume calculations? So I don't think we're going to get through it this week, but what are we doing next week? If there's no plan for next week, I think I'll go on for next week and finish this part of it. Uh, all, right, all right, so here we have, what's the complexity of W? Well, there's a simple case, which is kind of trivial. Supposing W is a unit operator. If W is the unit operator, let's first of all think, I find it always helpful to think visually about these things. Um, U is a, a thing in a space. The space is the space of unitary operators. Here's the identity over here. We've talked about that before. U corresponds to a um, uh, to some point here, and um, yeah. We start with the thermal field double, which just means the unit, the unit, the unit operator acting on the thermal field double. We start over here, we run the system until we get to U. We run the system until we get to U. Then we apply this W operator, which shifts us a little bit somehow in this unitary space. And then we run backward. If W is the unit operator, that's the simplest possible case, then U dagger and U cancel, and the complexity of what you have left over is zero. Okay? represent that by just saying this thing here just takes you and backtracks over the same place and gets you back to where you started, the complexity is zero. What happens if W is not the unit operator? Then it displaces you a little bit and then you run backward. Okay. What happens when you run backward? Well, in a chaotic system, in a, in a, uh, in a chaotic system, the expectation would be that you run backward for a ways, but then eventually you depart and go off in some other direction. How far back do you go before you depart? Well, that's a scrambling time. And the reason it's a scrambling time is because if you think in terms of circuits, what you've done is you've evolved, a, let's say you perturbed one qubit and then evolve back. Okay. In that one qubit that you've disturbed, there's only one qubit out of many, it takes time for the effect to spread throughout the system. And for some period of time, most of the qubits don't know that you didn't put the unitary operator in here. We're going to work this out in some detail. 
but, uh, but most of the qubits don't even know that you did this. So most of the system still thinks it's uh, that you put in the unit operator, but then eventually the effect of this W here will spread itself out throughout the system, and then the whole system knows, oh, uh, the system perturbed, it's perturbed big time now because the perturbation has affected the whole system and it goes off in some other direction. That's the expectation from a chaos point of view. Um, and we're going to try to calculate the complexity, if you like, starting here, going off here. What's the complexity of this whole trajectory between here and here? Um, that's the goal. And then to compare it with geometry. Here's the way you think about it. You start with a circuit. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you divide the circuit in half. You divided it, let's call it at time t equals zero. It doesn't matter what time we call it. We're going to apply u, w, your dagger, but I'm going to apply W right at the center here. Someplace in here, one of the qubits has been affected. Has been affected by applying W, a single qubit operator. And then, let's, uh, yeah, let's write this out. Supposing U is a product of uh, gates. G1, G2, dot, 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 up to Gn. U is a product of gates, starting with the first gate, the second gate, the third gate. It doesn't matter whether I use this kind of parallel circuit or not. You just think of it as a product of gates. Then the precursor, this is the precursor operator. The precursor operator is G1 dagger, G2 dagger, dot up to Gn dagger, single qubit operator, and then in reverse Gn. Dot, 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 down to G1. As I said, if W was 1, we would start canceling these operators one by one. Is it clear what I did? This, of course, is U dagger. If this is U, this is U dagger. And we would just collapse the whole thing uh, gate by gate. Okay. What if W is not equal to 1? So W is not equal to 1, but it is a single qubit operator. After the first time interval, again, we'll divide this thing into time intervals. In the first time interval, everybody talks to somebody else. But in particular, this guy might interact with the one directly below him. Everybody else interacts with somebody. I won't bother drawing it. In the next time interval, these two interact with somebody else. And therefore, the knowledge, the information that this qubit was perturbed spreads throughout the system. All right? As we run the circuit this way. We're also told to run the circuit in the opposite direction. with a sort of mirror image here somewhere and so forth with a mirror image. And so as we work the circuit in the other direction, the the information that this one's been perturbed also spreads it out, itself out, and it spreads itself out in a completely reflected way. After a given time, some number of qubits have been affected by this. It spreads like an infection. It spreads like, a, uh, like an epidemic. And we can represent that. I'm going to represent that by just drawing a growing fan here, uh, which just indicates inside the fan here are the qubits which have been affected. Outside are the ones which haven't been affected. This is schematic, of course. Same thing on this side. 
All right. The things that you can cancel are the ones in here. They're at any given time the qubits that have not been, that have not felt the effect of, uh, of the perturbation here. So they're in here. We can cancel those out. And the circuit then, the smallest circuit, the point is here, we're talking about the smallest circuit. That can uh, that can create the precursor operator. As far as we know, in any case, the smallest circuit that you can generate that will create the pre precursor operator has all of the gates that are in here. Depending on how far you go, you'll either pick up things out here or you'll pick up only things in here. Okay, so the qubits that have been affected by this one here. The number of them grow exactly as if we were talking about a infection uh, spreading or an epidemic spreading. The epidemic spreads uh, by assumption by two body interactions. And randomly, at every instant of time, everybody shakes hands with somebody, then they rearrange, they shake hands with somebody else, and, uh, and that tells us how, how the infection grows. It tells us how many. Um, how many qubits at any time have been affected? That is called the size. The definition of the number of qubits that have been affected is called the size of the, um, or little s. And it's a function of t. It's a function of t. And it grows from T. It is the size of the epidemic as a function of time. Eventually, everybody gets sick, and then it doesn't change anymore. Yeah. So just this drawing, the fact that there's a fan, this sort of presupposes that there are local interactions here, right? It presupposes k-local interactions. Oh, oh, I have not literally meant that these are... Yeah, are, yeah that's all I want to say. I said it was schematic. Yeah, yeah. As is representing in here the ones that are there. That's number one, is the size. Now, so the size, uh, the size will do something, will saturate. What's the, what's the complexity? The complexity is not the size. The complexity is the number of gates. Let's suppose we go out to here. Or to here, it doesn't matter. The complexity is the total number of gates that have not been canceled out. So it's sort of the number of gates in here, out to some time. Total number of gates in here or in here. And the size is the time derivative of the complexity. Each time you move a time a little bit, the size in here is the rate of change of the complexity. Complexity is sort of the integrated number of interactions that can't be canceled out. And the size is the number of qubits that have been affected. So you can write that this is equal. Well, the complexity now means the number of uncanceled, the number of, um, of gates that you can't cancel. This is a formula that, again, makes sense, but only for times shorter than exponential. It doesn't make sense for exponential times. So in particular, by the time you get out here, when the size, of course, is saturated, it's not going to get any bigger. The complexity will be, be growing linearly, but the size will be fixed. Okay. So we want to explore this quantity S of t. And the reason I want to explore it in detail and not, in, um, not just say it grows and then it saturates, which is good enough for a lot of things, but when we compare with geometry, we're going to have a fairly detailed, fairly detailed um, uh, comparison that involves actually the functional forms of these things. Not just uh, qualitative, but quantitative um, functional dependence. Okay, so let's talk about epidemics. How do epidemics grow? The function S of T, the actual function 
is called the logistic function. I have no idea what it has to do with logistics. I call it the epidemic function. Uh, what is logistics? That's about what they do in the army, right? What the quartermaster does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's been in the army here? Have you ever been in the army? No, not yet. <laughs> Who's been a boy scout? <laughs> not a single boy scout. Okay. The quartermaster is the person who does the logistics. What he has to do with the logistic function, I don't know. <laughs> Neither do we. <laughs> Neither do we. <laughs> but it has to do also with epidemics. So put those together and. Uh, okay. So here's the space of all participants qubits, or people who are about to get infected. How many of them are there? There are k people altogether. Here's the first one that's gotten infected. We've infected him by poking him with W. After a time t, I draw them as if they're all adjacent, but there's nothing particularly adjacent about them. I just take this set here of size s, that's the size of the infection at time t, after, after a certain number of steps. Okay. How many of them are there out here? There's k minus s of them out here. And the number out here, which are not equal to the first one, well, OK, good enough. Let's, let's leave it that way. How many new infections occur in one in, in the next step? The num on the average. On the average, it's possible that it would be zero. If everybody in here, when they mix themselves up, wound up shaking hands with somebody who's already in here, nothing happens. These guys shake hands with them, these guys shake hands with nothing happens. But on the average, um, the change in the size of the epidemic is equal, average, k minus s, that's, you take a particular person who's already sick, his probability of infecting a new person is k minus s over the total number of qubits. But actually, if you want to be really precise, it's over k minus 1. Why is the minus 1 there? But this is not quite yet, ready yet. This, this is the probability that any given one of them will affect somebody on the outside. As, a, as a, uh, It's k minus s over the total number of qubits that he can infect. That's k minus 1 because he can't infect himself. Okay? But now there are s qubits in here that can affect somebody, so we multiply this by s. And now we convert this to a differential equation. We assume that this can be converted to a differential equation. The s by the, uh, the t. Some t, let's call it tau. It's, it's going to wind up being t over the ABS radius, but let's just call it tau. One step of the uh, computation. Yeah. The operator u that you're using was inherited from a time evolution, so yeah. it's local, presumably. K local. K, well, the Hamiltonian doesn't have spatial locality yeah. on the boundary? Okay. No. Well, how do we know that? Why? Yeah. We know that because it's a fast square Okay. Great. Right. Yeah. You're assuming that s is small compared to k? No. Then no, when k gets to be as big as s, it just can't grow anymore. No, no, but if you have s of them infecting and they happen to infect the same guy. Let's see, I, I think this... No, they can't shake hands with the same guy. Oh, you, oh, they each get to shake hands with somebody. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, then, okay, good. Scared me. <laughs> okay. All right, this is called the logistic equation or something like that. And it has a solution. This function is called logistic function. What's that? Something like f of x times something yeah. minus f1 <coughs> constant minus f of x is called logistic function. Logistic function that I know is s is equal to k e to the tau divided by k minus 1. This is k minus 1, which makes no difference whatever whether you call this k instead of k minus 1. I've just kept it around to, uh, to impress you. Uh, k minus 1 <laughs> plus e to the tau. 
this is the uh, this is the logistic part. Right? Does this agree with what you said? Uh, yes. I think yes, it does. Yes, yeah. 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 Right. This is a solution for that. Okay. So let's look at it for, first of all for small tau. For small tau, this is negligible. I'm working in the approximation that k is equal to k minus 1. So s just grows as e to the tau, as expected. Of course, we expect it to grow uh, exponentially with tau. Uh, as expected, it starts out growing exponentially. I'm going to make it very it grows exponentially. OK, what happens when tau is very large? When tau is very large, this is much bigger than this. Okay, and then e to the tau cancels, and we just get k. Why k? Because everybody's infected, and it just stays that way. Nobody gets uninfected. So this goes up and goes over like that. Now, let's suppose k is rather large. Okay, larger than Where is the crossover? Where is the crossover where it stops growing? It's when e to the tau is a water k. We separated the two regimes by saying e to the tau is either less than k or greater than k. And so it's e to the tau of order k or tau of order log k. That's the scrambling time. Let's call it tau star. That's the scrambling time. And uh, that's exactly what the scrambling time is. It's the time for the infection or for the, for the operator growth to affect everybody. And that's logarithmic k. Logarithmic in entropy if we're talking about a random circuit. Okay, so that's the way it looks. If k is large, large enough that log k is large, uh, then this crossover happens out at log, log k here. Now let's normalize it. Let's normalize it so we're talking about the size over k. It goes to 1 out here. It's very, very small. It's exponential, it's more very, very small, almost until it gets to the point where it rises. And it rises over a uh, fixed distance here, which doesn't, uh, which is just as more or less fixed. And so the bigger k gets, this just moves out and gets sharper and sharper. A very large k, it's practically a, um, a step function, but it's not a step function, though. It, uh, it exponentially grows till it gets to the place where it crosses over, and then it jumps to about 1. But with a particular form, and this form is interesting, we're going to, we're going to come back to that form, because we're going to be able to confirm that form in the geometry uh, picture. Okay, so. That's the that's the size. The size goes like this. What about the complexity? We get the complexity by integrating the size. So the complexity. Fortunately, I have collaborators who can do integrals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I forgot to write it down. No, I didn't. No, I did. <laughs> hey, what's the formula for the complexity? Log 1 plus 1 over So again, log of k, log of k, plus e to the tau, e to the tau, yeah. got it, uh, minus one, and the log, minus log what? Uh, just minus one. And minus one, one inside or outside? Inside. Oh, you mean this is k minus one? Yeah. Oh, the hell with that. That's not important. Okay. And then multiply the whole thing by k outside the log. K outside the log? 
Okay, now let me see if I... No, no. No. You know, you can get us into the town. Okay. Complexity equals logarithm of one, sorry about one plus e to the tau minus tau star. Now remember, tau star is log of k. Yeah. So it's that means over k. Yeah, overall factor of k. Overall multiple. Ah, yes, yeah. that's that's what I have. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Take this k and put it into the exponent, and it becomes tau minus tau star. This is a pattern, tau minus tau star, that the complexity is a function not just of tau, but of tau minus the scrambling time. This is connected with that picture that I drew that looked like this. The time in here, when the complexity doesn't where there's complete cancellation here. So the growth of complexity, this part cancels, and that time in here is of order tau stars. Tau minus tau stars is exactly this so-called switchback effect, uh, and appears in this form here. That's, that's the way the complexity, or strictly speaking, it's the number of uncanceled gates. Number of uncanceled gates, but I'll call it the complexity even though it's never been proved to be the absolute minimum um, circuit that you can form. And let's just draw what it looks like. The size grows like this, and a T star or tau star jumps up and goes across here. The complexity, it, grow, it does grow exponentially here. I didn't mean to not have it grow exponentially. But uh, if k is large, it's hard to plot it because it, uh, it's so small. OK, during the exponential period, the complexity and, uh, the, um, and s grow the same way. So the complexity grows the same way in here. But then when it gets up to here, instead of flattening out, it grows linear. grows linearly because its derivative is the size. Up in here, the complexity is given by k. That's the k on the outside. It certainly grows with the number of qubits times tau minus tau star. This is the switchback effect. This is the effect <coughs> that you get for free, almost for free, uh, this, um, this, proportion, this portion over here where the infection has not yet spread out significantly and that's for the, uh, that's for the, uh, for the scrambling time here. Okay, this is the thing that we want to try to match by looking um, at both action and volume 
for not for circuits, but for black hole uh, geometries. That, and we'll see. The match is, is, is um, surprisingly good. We'll do that next time. Okay, questions? Richard was not here, but Richard was the one who asked me what's the confirmation that this, now this is the confirmation. What is it the confirmation of? It's a confirmation of the idea. No, well, we haven't confirmed it yet. We've just defined it. But, um, but I've defined a quantity which has all the unnecessary gates removed. As far as I know, it's the minimum number of gates it takes to make the circuit which produces a precursor. That is what is called the complexity. The confirmation will be to see that we get the same formula, basically the same formula for, um, for the, either the volume or the action of a black hole when you insert a precursor or when you insert a shock wave by going back in time, throwing something in, and then going forward in time again. All right, so that's, that's the goal, to see that confirmation. We'll do that next week, and then we'll pick up with our usual routine um, of alternation after that. Uh, does anybody have a good thing that we might uh, study the following time? As I said, I, I, I somewhat prefer, personally, things that people here are doing. But uh, if they're interesting. Nobody has a, uh, has a suggestion? Well, the other alternative is something you've always wanted to know and uh, that uh, we can talk about. I can talk about one sort of 